Good morning. Oh, how are we doing this morning? Oh, I am excited this morning. You know mornings when you're just like, you, you're just like, I'm happy to be alive. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes I wake up and there's no music in my heart and it's like, but then some mornings you wake up and you're like, ah, today is going to be a good day. So why, can you just say that right now? Say today is going to be a good day. Today is going to be a good day. So this morning, I want to talk about life not going as planned. Life not going as planned. Most of us, I would dare say, have an idea of the way that we see our lives going. Am I right? Do we kind of have an idea, an expectation? I know if you're super creative and like artistic, maybe that's really free flowing, like this beautiful breeze going through a meadow. Um, and so it's very free flowing, but you have an expectation hoping that things are going to go well, right? That is why we plan. That is why we prepare. That is why we pray. Because we want our lives to go in a certain direction. We desire a certain outcome. And so I want to just tell you a story um, about one of the missions trips that I got to be a part of a few years back. I went to the country of Guyana, and we were taking a group of about 25 high school students with us. I was super excited when I got asked to partner and, and co-lead this trip. It was my first time leading a missions trip. And can I tell you, I had great expectations of the way that this trip was going to go, right? You don't, you know, you don't say yes to a mission trip if you're expecting it to be bad. So, I mean, I had these students praying, we were fasting, we were learning dramas and skits, everyone was preparing their testimony. I mean, we were prepared. So we get to this country of Guyana, which is in South America. I had never, I'd never actually heard of it before. And so we show up to this country, and from the time that we arrived, nothing went as planned. Nothing went as planned. We arrived in the middle of rainy season, and in Guyana, in the city that we were in, rainy season was the time that they are very thankful for because they need the rain, but their sewage was in the middle of the roads. And so during rainy season, the roads were covered with sewage. And so we, it was a very hot country, and so it was above, you know, hundreds and above, and the humidity was through the roof. And so, you know, we're coming over as missionaries, so we have to wear long pants, and now we have to wear closed-toed shoes because sewage is going through the streets. And everything on this missions trip that could go wrong went wrong. Missionaries were supposed to show up and pick us up. Literally one day we never left the compound. That one day that we didn't leave the compound, the toilets overflowed. And so we spent seven hours trying to get the toilet sewage back where it needs to. I mean, it just was a crazy trip. And as a leader for the first time, my job the entire trip was trying to keep people positive. You know what I'm saying? Like, what a hard job. Everything is going wrong. Everyone is sweaty. No one's really doing any ministry because of all the confusion and different things that happen. And so most of the time, here we prayed, we prepared, we saved up our money, we fasted, we did all these things, and we're just sit twiddling our thumbs or shoveling poop. And here I am, my co-leader's like, well, I have nothing to say, it's your job. So, I mean, we came up with every crazy youth group game you could possibly do, and we were just by the end of it done. So by the end of the trip, we get told, the missionaries are like, we know this trip has not been what you guys were expecting it to be, but we, prepare, we, we have a great free day for you, like a rewards day. You guys have been amazing. You've gone with, you know, you've had to go with the flow. Things haven't gone the way you wanted. So we are going to actually take you down the river. You're going to have a great day on the water. It's going to be beautiful. And so we're all like, yes, this is going to be great. It is so hot. It will be wonderful to be in a boat and go in the water and swim. <sighs> we were just excited. I mean, that was like kind of like hope on a bad day, right? We need, though, during seasons when life is not going the way it is, it's amazing when somebody tells you, hey, you get to go on vacation for a day. Wouldn't that just change everything if Pastor Richard invited all of us on his cruise? <laughs> but then it wouldn't be a vacation for him, I guess. But it was that moment 
moment where we were all excited. So we get ready to go. I tell all the students, hey, this is what we're doing. Everyone's excited. We're ready for just a carefree day to not be hot. And we show up in the morning with all of our stuff. And the missionaries look at us and say, you know what? I know we talked about being able to go swimming, but evidently there's something weird with the water. And so you can't swim in it, but we're still going to do the boat ride. And you have to wear your pants and your shoes because we're still with the locals. And so I had all the students that we had to go change back into our ministry clothes. And so we're getting it. We arrive. We get in our you know, trucks and we arrive at the boat place. Now, I like to visit Florida. So when I'm thinking of a boat ride in the water, I'm thinking beautiful blue waters. You know what I'm saying? And I'm thinking a nice boat because you're taking 20 something people on this boat ride on the water for free day. When we go to the Dominican Republic, catamarans, you're going snorkeling. It's an amazing free day. Okay. So my expectations were like this, whatever. I can't swim. I'm in khaki pants and tennis shoes, but it's going to be beautiful. All right. So we show up on this dinky river and the water is black black I mean you cannot see into it even an inch and they have these little rickety wooden like fishing boats for us with a little motor and so they're like here we are let's go on this you know amazing rewards day and so my job has to kick back in come on guys this is gonna be great you know, like, let's make everyone positive again. And so we get into the boats, and everyone's hot, and it's sticky, and we're on this boat ride that nobody wants to be on in this black-brown water that is not pretty. And so we just are like, all right, we'll make the most of it. We're going on this boat ride, and our tour guide, the guy who's driving the boat, our tour guide is telling us about the land and all different things. And as we're driving, I realized, or I noticed, that there was tons of children like playing along the water. They were fishing, they had, were getting buckets out of water, but nobody was in the water. So I said to the guy, I said, how come nobody swims in this water? I mean, I know it's black and I wouldn't want to swim in it, but why is nobody swimming? It is so hot. And I just figured, you know, if you're living in this area that it might be refreshing as children, you don't really care if it's black or not, you'd swim in a puddle. And so I just was like, why are none of the kids swimming in this water? And he said, well, you can't because it's filled with piranhas. And he said, so no one can swim in this water. All you can do is fish in it or you can get water to clean your clothes and different things like that. So anyways, I'm like, whatever. I, I mean, I just don't even know what to do with this information. So I'm like, I've got to create some sort of fun for this day. So I decide a water fight won't hurt. You probably won't get bit by a piranha if I just scoop some water up and splash my neighbor, all right? Because we got to do something. This day is going from bad to worse, all right? No swimming, hot clothes, long boat ride in an ugly area. So I decide to splash the kid next to me. Then that kid starts to splash and a water fight ensues. Everybody's happy. It is wonderful. I look at the kid next to me and I joke around, I'm like, whoo, and I act like I'm going to throw him in. And oh, then everyone's having a good time because everyone thought that person was going to get thrown in. Everyone's joking around and the guy next to me, my co-leader, looks at me and is laughing and he's like, ha ha ha, Sarah, your turn, and shoves me but forgets to grab me. And all of a sudden, I feel myself somersaulting backwards off the boat in the last see is my tour guide's face with sheer panic on it. And then I'm in the water. I am literally, I pop up in the water and I am like, I am going to die. The boat is still going that direction because it still has to turn around. And all I could think of was the princess bride. For those of you that have seen that movie, the quote, that is the sound of the shrieking eels. I'm thinking I am going to be torn apart little bit by little bit, and I'm going to die here in Guyana. You know what I'm saying? Do any of you guys ever have moments in life where you feel like you have just gone overboard? You know, that life just gives you something so unexpected that you've, you, you've been preparing, you've been planning, you've done everything right, and yet you find yourself being thrown overboard 
Lord and the very thing that you were doing your best in. That is how I felt. I felt like in this moment, I remember just feeling such shock and awe and fear and intense hatred of the person that threw me in. All of that in a split second. And I mean, all of a sudden, I am like, I'm going to die, swim hard. So I try swimming as fast as I can. I, I mean, I'm a swimmer. I'm a li- I was a lifeguard. So I was like, I can do this, but I have never swam with baggy khaki pants and heavy tennis shoes. So what normally would have been an easy swim, I am like, you know, trying to move. And then it doesn't help that you're so panicked you can barely think, right? Because I keep imagining things touching my legs and going, because the water's black. I can't see anything. So it felt like an eternity. The boat finally gets to me, and I didn't care who it was, but all I saw was a bunch of arms that came and pulled me out of that water. And there are moments in life, there are moments in life where we need people. There are moments in life when life doesn't go as planned. And church, I just want to encourage you this morning. Because some of you, you are in overboard moments. You're in seasons of your life where you have done everything well. You have done everything right. And just like me, you're in that black water. You're feeling all alone. You're scared. You're confused. There's a million different thoughts going through your head. None of them that seem to make any sense or help you to get out of that season any faster. But God gives us an ability where we need people. We need people to reach down and grab us out of that situation. And so this morning, I want to look at the word, and I want to see what Jesus does in overboard moments. Because it's not just my story. It's all of our story. In life, we have moments where life just doesn't make sense. So if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to Matthew chapter 14? And we're going to start at verse 22 and read through 33. It says, Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the lake of the other side. Now, real quick, before I go any further, does anyone know what what this is talking about? Immediately after this, because this is kind of key. Anybody know? In CCM, we just yell things out, so... No, not yet. He fed the 5,000. Yes. So the disciples were just sitting with Jesus, and they got to be part of a miracle. Jesus just multiplied the loaves and fishes and fed over 5,000 people with just a couple loaves of bread and a couple pieces of fish. And the disciples were part of the entire thing. The disciples were the ones that were carrying around the baskets and feeding the people, watching it multiply. And scripture says in the verses right before that everyone ate and was satisfied. So I want you to imagine the disciples experiencing a miraculous moment with Jesus. Something that they had never seen. They had seen Jesus heal. They had heard Jesus teach. But they had never seen actually the Lord actually give substance to a physical body. He multiplied food. And the disciples didn't just see it. They participated in it. And they got to eat. And they were satisfied. They were coming out of a moment where God didn't just meet other people's needs, but he met their needs. So here they are, and scripture says, right after he feeds the 5,000, he looks at his disciples and says, you need to get into the boat and cross on the other side while I'm going to send the people home. Isn't that interesting? That took a long time to send 5,000 people home. Why did he tell the disciples to get into the boat without him? Right after this miraculous experience, this encounter that they had. Let's keep reading. After Jesus sent them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Verse 24. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble from way, or far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, just like we're supposed to get today. Oh, is that prophetic or what? 
And I'm not normally prophetic, so that works. A strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. And in their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once and said, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, then tell me to come walk on water. Yes, Jesus said, come. So Peter went over to the side of the boat and walked on water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped, and the disciples worshipped him and said, You really are the Son of God. If you're taking notes this morning, number one in my notes is this. Overboard moments are a part of life, and God is with us. Overboard moments are a part of life, and God is with us. As I look at this story, one of the things that jumped out is out at me as I was reading it, it was the fact that Jesus knew the storm was coming. He sent the disciples into a boat after a miraculous encounter, and he said, go off, and I'm going to stay here for a while. It's a part of life. And Jesus, at this point, is not moved by it. He knew the disciples, the, the winds and the rains were coming. Storms are a natural part of life. They weren't being punished. They weren't in trouble. They didn't do anything wrong. It was just the season, and so a storm came. And Jesus was not stressed out about it. They, he knew that they were all right. It said that he was on the mountainside praying, and he could see the boat. It was a ways away. Church, can I remind you that when the storms of life happen, although they may surprise you, they do not surprise your father. And God is always watching. He is always aware of where his children are. He sees you, whether it is in time of miraculous provision, and he sees you in seasons when you are getting into a boat, going somewhere you've never gone before. God sees you. And the thing that I remind, remembered as I was reading that, the scripture says that Jesus, although he is not present with us, he is our great intercessor, Hebrews says. And he is constantly praying on our behalf. Church, we need to remember, although we don't have the physical presence of Jesus with us, he is by the Father. He does see what is going on. And he is praying that his grace would be sufficient to meet every need. That we would receive strength. That we would receive what we need while we are waiting for the answer to come. You are never alone, church. You are never alone. You are never so far. Life just doesn't happen in a way that God is not with us. Then why are we surprised? I ask myself this, because every time Ben and I have a hard situation, whether it's our finances, whether it's our children, whether it's a health thing, whatever it is, I'm always surprised. How about you? Are you ever like ready for it or are we surprised too, right? It comes out of nowhere. Even when it's a rough season, I'm still surprised. I think I'm more surprised when it's already bad, right? And what do we do when bad things happen? We try to get an answer. Anyone else try to give an answer to why these bad things happen? Or is it just a woman thing? It might be just a woman thing. We immediately try to start solving this. Like, well, did I pray enough? Did I, maybe I wasn't being obedient. Maybe I'm doing something. I mean, immediately my brain wants to assign an answer. And yet the disciples had none. They had none. I think part of our problem is being human beings. We're created the image and the likeness of God. And we were created for a world that wasn't broken. Before Adam and Eve sinned, there was no sickness. There was no financial heartache. There was not broken promises and friendships and relationships that are gone in a moment. Our hearts are always going to be surprised because this side of the new heaven and a new earth, we were not created to live in a broken world. 
Sin came in and disrupted the very world and realm that we were supposed to live in. And that is why every time a, a family member passes away or relationship is, is broken or a promotion is not received and you're thinking, where is my blessing? We're surprised. And so we're left like the disciples in a boat with the winds and the waves all around us feeling totally alone. But I love what this passage, of, passage says, and I think it so speaks to us when we're in those moments, in these overboard moments of life. It says that Jesus began to come towards them, walking on water. Church, one of the most encouraging things that God has been teaching me is that whether I can see him or not, he is there. Whether I can sense him, whether I can feel him, whether I can hear him, he is there in every storm, in every moment of life that doesn't go as planned. He is there. And the problem is not him. The problem rests in the fact that my emotions and my circumstances have an ability to cloud and blur my vision so I no longer can see the person of Jesus. I am only seeing my circumstances. My thoughts, my feelings, my emotions. You see, they saw the storm. They saw the waves. And it says that they were afraid. Church, when we become fearful, which is a normal emotion, it is an, it's an emotion that wells up inside of us, and it can be positive or negative. We want Julia to be afraid of getting hit by a car. She's four, and she thinks she's invincible. So I need her to believe me when I say, if you run across that road, a car is going to, and you're going to be dead. Right? Fear is going to keep that child alive. At least so we think. You know, we're banking on it, at least for a while. But fear is not supposed to be the, her master, her teacher. It is only for a short season until she has an understanding of the way that life works, has an understanding of what she can do and when she can do it, when she's tall enough to be seen by other cars. Church, God's desire is that we would grow in maturity. And every time life comes, instead of being shocked and surprised, and we just stand there like deers in a headlight, that we would be able to say, oh my word, I'm shocked and surprised. I'm sitting in this black water. I can't see anything, and I see my boat leaving me. And then we come to and we say, okay, what am I going to do now? God is looking for his church to understand that he is with him. Our faith cannot be based on circumstances. Andy Stanley said, life circumstances will reveal where our faith is in. It's either in the person of Jesus or our faith is attached to circumstances. Now let me explain this. When you first encounter Jesus, it is an experience, right? For most of us, it is an experience. We encounter the love of God and the love of God draws us. When you are an early Christian, when you're an, a baby Christian, you get a lot of prayers answered, right? I mean, I'm always jealous of new believers. They have such passion and excitement, and they pray for things, and they see it happen. Even my son, he can pray for me. He prayed for my dad, and my dad got healed. Jew hasn't even encountered the Lord in a real way, but he had faith like a child, and he got healed. God honors the prayers of just faith like a child. But here's what happens. As we grow, as we mature, we also have to grow in our faith. So what happens when our faith is only attached to our situations or only attached to when prayers get answered? Jesus now becomes Santa Claus or genie in a bottle. You got to rub me the right way, right? And our faith becomes based on works and not on grace. Because I have to pray right. I have to fast right. Oh, my prayers aren't being answered. There must be something wrong with me. There must be something wrong. There must be hidden sin. Our brain begins to start going. And so what was once grace is now striving, trying to convince a loving God that he's loving. And we are now getting crazy in our minds. 
How many times have I sat on my front porch and wept? Because I'm like, God, you are not answering anything that I pray. Anyone feel like that ever? I have countless seasons where I pray and nothing happens, right? And then I start striving, and then I try to do everything right, and the Lord's always gently tapping me, Sarah, this is about grace. And I say, but you're not answering. Right? Don't you have, I have these conversations with the Lord. And so the only thing I've learned to do when I'm in those moments where nothing is going as planned is to get into my word. And I say, okay, Jesus, show me your nature. Show me your character. Because my circumstances, my feelings, my emotions are telling me that you are not a good, good father. So some of you this morning might have been trying to sing the song and you just needed to stop because you said, I can't sing that God is good. Can I tell you that I've been in this church and I've done the same thing? And there's nothing wrong with that. Because you have to allow your soul, you have to allow your emotions and your questions, you have to be real and honest with where you are. But there is a time where you begin to say, okay, God, if my, if my faith is so easily rocked, then maybe my faith is rooted in the wrong thing. Maybe my faith needs to go back to the nature and character of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said that he alone is the rock, that when the winds and the rains come, he alone is the firm foundation underneath your feet. Church, are you serving God so that your needs can be met? Or are we serving him because Jesus truly was the son of God who died on earth a horrible death because he loved you, because he took your sin and my sin upon him, and then he resurrected on the third day? Do we serve Jesus because he is the only one all throughout history that has ever resurrected on the third day? That is the foundation that I build my life on. So when the wind and the rain and the sand and everything begins to start blowing, the questions come in my mind of where are you, God? The one, th one foundation I can stand on is that your word says that you are with me. You said in this life there's going to be trials and tribulations. In John, Jesus said that's a promise. It's one we don't ever like to quote, though, right? When we're praying it out. But you know what I say Jesus said? He said this. And as I look at this word, I see countless stories. Countless stories. Of people not hanging on to just the promise of what God was going to do for them. But somehow holding on that God, you are still worth serving. And you are still worth following. That is maturity in Christ. That is the desire that God's heart is for every one of us. Because in life, storms will come. But God is with us. The Bible says that he draws near to the brokenhearted. God says that when you cry out, he does listen. David, when he was in the longest season of a wilderness or overboard moment, when he was in a season where he was abandoned by everything, he lost his family, his friends, his job security, his wife, and he was running for his life. He penned the most famous Psalms, Psalms 23, and I want you just to look at it with me real fast. Psalms 23, David says this, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Did David in that moment have everything that he needed in the natural? No. He was living in a cave. He was running from Saul. But how can this be? He can't lie because it's scripture. Yet David found a place where in his relationship with God, it moved from what God could do for him, taking down giants with stones. It moved from just the miraculous to a place where David said, I'm going to find my rest and my peace and my worth and my value, not in any other circumstance, but that you are with me and your presence is enough. There is such a transition and that is what I believe God is, I really feel like the Holy Spirit is just saying, he is wanting to encourage us to not get stuck 
in the water. Don't get stuck in the valley of the shadow of death because he is wanting to move you through. David said, he lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me besides peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. And this is key. And even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. He's walking through the darkest valley. David walked through 17 years of a darkest valley. Maybe even longer. Joseph. Walk through a darkest valley. Abraham walked through a darkest valley. Jesus, our Savior, walked through the valley of the shadow of death. In life, overboard moments come. Seasons that are out of our control. You've done everything right. Can I encourage you this morning? God is not mad at you. God loves you, and he never intended for you to live in a world with brokenness. He never intended us to live in a world with heartache. But he said, while you're living in this world, remember that it's something eternal. In me is life. David found the secret to having life in the midst of a painful circumstance, in a painful series, in a painful moment. He says, your rod and your staff protect and comfort me, and you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Soul-searching times of questioning are not wrong. They have the potential to help us to know the Lord in a new way. But here's the key. If we choose to move ahead and not stay in the valley of the shadow of death. You have to make the choice. When I was in the water that day, when I was waiting for that boat, thinking I was going to die, I had a decision to make. I could just stop swimming and just say, you know what, I can't do it anymore. There have been moments in life where my heart felt like that. There have been moments where my heart said, it's just too tired. I don't want to keep singing God is good. I don't want to keep declaring. I don't want to, I don't want to keep working. My heart is so exhausted. And so I have to just rest in the fact in my ability to just float on who God is. And say, God, I surrender. I can't figure this out. I can't figure out why this is happening. And so I'm just going to surrender and say that you are God and I am not. And if these things don't make any sense and I have no answers, I'm going to choose to not assign an answer in my limited ability to see. And I'm going to let go and I'm going to trust. And church, when you get to that point where you cannot save yourself and you cannot assign the right answers, can I tell you that Jesus always comes in and says, let me save you. And just like Peter, he came and said, Peter, he reached out his hand and he grabbed Peter out of the water. It wasn't Peter doing it. It was Jesus reaching out his hand and grabbing Peter out of the boat. When I was floating in that black water, I said, I can't do it anymore. I'm exhausted from swimming. I cannot see the end. I cannot see what's below me. But then that moment, hands reached down and grabbed me out of that horrible river. And this is my last point. Overboard moments are an opportunity for real relationships. Overboard moments in life are an opportunity for real relationships. It's an opportunity for your relationship with Jesus to grow in a way that you have never experienced or known him in a personal way. Jesus revealed himself to Peter as teacher as rabbi, as miracle worker, as healer, but it wasn't until Peter was sinking that he actually learned the physical touch of Jesus and him as the savior, personally. God's desire is that every single one of us would experience and encounter him in a new way. His desire is that your relationship would move from what it has been into the past into a new aspect. Peter is the rock. 
Peter is the one that led so many Jews into the saving knowledge of Jesus and then into the Gentiles. He needed to know Jesus as his savior himself. He needed to know that he could not do it by works because Paul, Peter was a Jew. Everything was about works. Everything was about performance, doing it according to the law. And in that moment, nothing else mattered. There was nothing Peter could do. Even his faith to walk on water, Jesus said, I'm not impressed. Don't worry about it. You need to know me as Savior. And he reached his hand out, and he grabbed him up out of the water. And this is what I love. Peter, not only Peter and Jesus didn't just stay there, they actually got in the boat with everyone else. As I was reading the scripture, I'd never noticed something before. Never even thought about it. But so often when we pray, we expect God to do something supernatural. And that's the way our answer is going to come. Right? Like we're praying into this, this, this mystical void. And we think manna's going to fall from heaven again, like in the Old Testament. But here Peter was, he was drowning, and he needed help. What did God do to save Peter? Did he just give him a word and he had to just go off of that? No, he gave him a physical human hand. Jesus didn't just save Peter. Being the supernatural son of God, he was a physical man prayed up, full of the Holy Ghost. And that is why he could walk on water. That is why his words had authority over the winds and the rains, because he was a man full of authority and knew who he was. And out of that posture, out of that position, being fully man, he reached out a human hand and said, Peter, I'm going to pull you up. Church, can I remind us that there are people all around us that need a human hand, that need someone that is full of the Holy Ghost, someone that has been praying, someone that has a relationship with the Father, who knows who they are, and that even when they're exhausted, they have the ability and internally inside of them because of the Holy Ghost to reach out and pull people out of overwhelming situations in life. Jesus had to leave his place of prayer to save him. Whoa! Some of us, we don't want to talk to our neighbors. We just want to pray for them. Wouldn't that be easier? Oh my word, I would love it if some days, instead of disciplining my four-year-old, I could just pray for her. But you know what? Sometimes Julia doesn't need me to just pray for her. She needs her mommy to leave her prayer closet and come and spend time with her. She needs to know that she is loved. She needs to be taught how to play with her, her little toys. She needs somebody to spend time with her. And in the same way, everybody that we come in contact with needs somebody who is prayed up and filled with the Holy Ghost to reach out a hand and say, let me speak life into you. Let me help meet a need in your world. That is why we do things like Pontiac Outreach, Dominican Republic, why we make lunches. Our amazing widows, Ruth and company, made over 40 lunches that we passed out last Saturday. That is why we do it. Because just to tell people Jesus loves them while not meeting their need is nothing. Jesus said, faith without works is dead. We have to put our love into action. And when I was in that water, it wasn't Jesus being supernaturally incarnated and all of a sudden coming down and swooping me up out of that water. It would have been a cool story. But the truth is, it was four or five arms pulling me out of the scariest moment that I had had up until that point. And when I got out of that boat, I had a decision to make. Do I kill the person that threw me in? Or do I forgive them and we move on? Because church, sometimes the very people that need to be the ones to help us are the very ones that pushed us in. Sometimes doing life with people is messy. And we hurt each other. 
We make wrong decisions in the body of Christ. And the enemy is so good about telling us to just stay in there. Don't grab their hands. They're just going to burn you again. And we want to pick and choose the people that we link arms with. And yet in that moment, I had to make a decision. Not one person's going to be able to pick this kid up. I got to let a whole lot of them lift me up. But it took vulnerability. It took me letting down my walls and getting real and saying, I can't save myself. Isn't that the same place that we need to live with the Father and with each other? There are moments in our marriage that Ben and I could not do alone. We prayed, we fasted, we went to counseling. But you know what? We needed a community to walk us through that healing point. We joke around in our small group. We say out of these 10, 15 marriages, we wouldn't be married if it wasn't for each other. Yeah, you can do it by yourself. Absolutely. But it's a whole lot harder. Because if I would have had to climb out of that rowboat, into that rowboat by myself, that whole boat was going to flip over. Jesus grabbed Peter by the hand. Who in your life right now needs you to shut your mouth? Don't make promises you can't keep. Don't give prophetic words that you don't know are from Jesus. Just reach out your hand. Just reach out your hand. Meet a need in their life. Give someone a hug. Tell someone that they are loved. When you see them broken, stop on the side of the road and offer someone a ride. Pay for someone's groceries. My sister, I'm ending with this. My sister and her husband and their family just lost um, their baby this past week. She was 18 weeks old and in my sister's stomach. And Eleanor, she was so precious. We got to see pictures. But I got to see in action what it looks like when the church body comes in and reaches out and pulls you out of that boat or pulls you out of that water. My sister didn't need a prophetic word telling her she's going to have another baby. She didn't need people telling her that she, people, I, I know how you feel. She needed people to love, to take care of their children. And this church has sent them gifts and foods and massages. I mean, they have, they have so overwhelmed my brother-in-law and my sister with tangible gifts and reminders telling them that they are loved and you are not alone. They can't meet the very need and the loss that is in their heart. Only God can. But in the process, we can be the body of Christ and we can love and we can do our part. I felt so guilty and so convicted after learning that because how many times have I done nothing because I didn't know what to do? I've had friends that have had miscarriages. And to be honest, I didn't know what to do. And so I didn't do anything. I sent a text message, I'm praying, I love you. But I felt like as I was studying the scripture, as I was, as I was listening to the Lord, I felt like the Holy Spirit said there is always something tangible that we can do when people are hurting, when people are going through overboard moments, people need a tangible way to see that they are loved. That is how healing, that is how it takes place when God's children step out and love full of the spirit, but in tangible ways. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you for every individual in this room this morning. I thank you for every journey that is represented in this room, a journey of faith. God, I pray in this moment that those that are searching, that they would hear that there is a God who loves them, who is looking forward to a moment where you would allow him to pick you up and save you.